Today, let's rummage around in an idea others have been throwing around, I think, a little too freely lately. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. The thing I've been hearing thrown around lately, and really I've I've been hearing it for the last couple of years since the last presidential election cycle, uh, is uh, imprisoning, incarcerating, or somehow otherwise punishing women uh, who get an abortion now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned and some of the laws that restrict abortions are back in effect or are fully in effect one way or the other. And I I understand uh, where those concerns are coming from. I just think we should probably give a little more thought to this before we start thinking freely about imprisoning another demographic in our culture, regardless of what we think about the issue, which I'll, which I'll come back to in a moment. It shouldn't be hard for you to tell where I'm going with this. I, I don't think it's a good idea. And it's not simply because I think, well, abortion, yeah, you know, it's really okay. I'm adamantly pro-life. I don't think it's okay. But I also don't think it's a responsible or good idea for us to be thinking about imprisoning mothers or imprisoning women who've had an abortion. Uh, And I want to give some options for why we should think more circumspectly and uh, not just more softly or more kindly, but more circumspectly uh, about what we're going to do. So uh, there are several steps that we need to take to get there. And I I think we can do all of this in one episode. We're going to give it a go anyway. Uh, And the first step would be just to talk about the acts, the the act of abortion itself. But but that also means talking about some other acts that have a similar moral content to abortion. So in particular, murder and suicide and filicide, Uh, in comparison to abortion, murder, the broad category that we're talking about, and then suicide and filicide because of some moral relationship they have, not only with murder, but also with abortion, and then what that might open up for us as we think about what we do in response to these acts. So when we talk about murder generically, broadly, normally we just mean, you know, somebody that, that unjustly, wrongfully killed another human being. And and generally, we just mean some stranger, you know, and it doesn't matter whether they're a stranger or not, but, you know, we just mean some other guy, some other girl out there, you know. they, And so that wrongful killing's response is fairly straightforward. We go to Genesis 9 in the Old Testament, or uh, we read about the sword that the government carries in the New Testament, and and we say, so you give life for life. You know, he carries the executioner's sword after all, uh, or if you're aware and socially conscious, and, and I am, and I, I do care about this issue, and know that there are injustices in the criminal justice system, and, you know, a capital punishment is pretty irreversible, so, I mean, fully irreversible, but, you know, uh, the, then the, the idea of capital punishment, if, if you might have a wrongful conviction, is, is pretty terrible, And so maybe it's life imprisonment, you know, and maybe life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. But then other cases, for some reason, there's a mitigating circumstance of some kind that's not a full life sentence and so on. So we have all kinds of punishments, but usually for murder, it does involve some kind of incarceration or forfeiture of your life. So for murder in general. But there are other forms of wrongful killing that, that would not evoke that response in us. Suicide is one of those. And I know how many have been affected by suicide. I mean, it's so prevalent in our society to begin with. Surely we all recognize by now that no matter, no matter what details you give to it, and I'll list a few that are named in Scripture that we talk about as suicides in just a moment, that in every single one of these, what we recognize is the tragedy that's involved. 
regardless of the motive of the person, it, regardless of whether that's what they intended to do or it's something they had to do because of something else that was going on, and, I, and I'm not saying it's ever justified like that. I'm saying we recognize that there is a tragedy involved, and yet it's still the wrongful taking of one's own life. We would say it's an immoral act. And again, and again if you had a family member that has taken their own life, I'm not condemning them. I'm not saying there's not forgiveness. I'm not saying any of that. But we recognize that we, we would never and should never, ever say to any person, you know, suicide might not be a bad idea here. Of course it's a bad idea, and we should always be looking for help the moment it becomes a reality that somebody might really be thinking about it. All of that I'll, I'll bring up again later as we talk about this, as we have the opportunity. But I just want to point out that as wrongful as we know it is, and, and we believe it is, we also recognize that it's tragic. So as we're looking at suicides in Scripture, for instance, just to talk about some that are removed enough that we're not talking about anything here and now, you know, Saul and his armor bearer, there's a legitimate suicide. You know, he wants, to, he wants to die, he asks for help, he doesn't get the help that he wants, falls on his own sword. His armor bearer sees what's happened, takes his own life out of respect for him, and there's a suicide. Ahithophel takes his life when he's disrespected. Nobody takes his counsel, and and so he, you know, he's he he goes back home and he hangs himself. And Judas takes his own life. And there are other cases of suicide where you would say, well, I wouldn't have used the word suicide for that. Or maybe you would, but you'd say, but that seems morally different. For instance, Samson, you know, fall, leaning on the on the pillars and taking down the the place where all the enemy were, and so on. So that. That kind of thing is different, right? A soldier who volunteers for some critical mission that has to be done knowing that it's going to cost him his own life, most likely, or even certainly. Even though we use the phrase, it's a suicide mission, we, we recognize there's something different about that. There's something actually virtuous and beyond just a regular moral requirement. It's not an obligation for someone to do that. Uh, they're super arrogatory is the word we use for that when someone does something heroic. Uh, they they go beyond what could be asked of them, uh, like Samson. And, I, and, you know, we can argue about how Samson's case plays out, but I, but I think it probably fits in that category. Uh, Abimelech, you know, is so embarrassed that he's going to die at the hand of a woman when a stone has fallen on his head from a woman's hand that he asks someone else to kill him. So you have assisted suicides, as as Saul was asking for, by the way, the first time. And then Zimri, when Omri is about to kill him, he knows he's going to be killed by the enemy. It might be torturous. Uh, it's certainly humiliating. Goes into the house and burns it over himself and dies, which is slightly different as well. And there are cases that where we talk about, you know, giving people cyanide tablets. I don't know if this is true or not. I'm just, you know, I know this is part of the legacy of soldiers and astronauts and things like that. So we'll send a spy in, but he gets a cyanide tablet just in case he's captured because being captured could mean, mean something worse than death. So here's how you take your own life. There is something different about that as well, but no matter how different it is, in every one of those circumstances, we wouldn't respond to it by saying, oh, you tried to commit suicide, so we're going to put you in prison to punish you for having tried to commit suicide, even though it is wrong. So the, the response to suicide is different than the response that we would have to murder. And then there's another case, not, not just murder, the broad category, or suicide, but filicide, which actually in Scripture is very closely related to suicide because your own future is bound up in the life of your offspring. So David's son Solomon, you think about all the accounts in the Old Testament, the promise of life was given through the offspring of that person. So it actually has a very close relationship to suicide itself, and in terms of punishment is sometimes thought of in that way. But here's the point, that in our culture, we recognize that, and filicide is, you know, the, take, the wrongful taking of your offspring's life, right? So your child, a filial, uh, your, your offspring, a son or daughter. The wrongful taking of that offspring's life is even worse. You know, most of us would say for sure, and, and in our culture, we certainly say this, it's, it's more vilified than murder generically because, because we believe in parental obligations, it, it, not just legal obligations. We have legal obligations. Like you have to provide for the physical and emotional well-being of your child. You have to do that. That's your obligation as a parent. 
But there's a social and moral obligation, too. Even if it weren't ensconced in law, we would know a parent has an obligation to take care of their child. Uh, I mean, to a, to a very great degree. Like, even to the extent of neglecting your own needs to meet your child's need, we would say socially and morally, you have that obligation. So the idea of a parent who not only fails to meet the basic needs of their offspring, but also violates their life, kills them, obviously we believe it's right or makes sense to prosecute a person like that and to punish a person like that because we would do that for murder more generically, and this is the most vicious form of murder that we can imagine. So on Phil's side, it goes the other way. With suicide, we were talking about it, it sort of goes the direction of saying, well, yeah, that it's a wrongful killing, but you, you know, you don't follow it up with imprisonment. You you look for help. You, you know, if the, if the person uh, tries or attempts or even just talks about it, we get help because we want to provide help. And we recognize that there's something tragic going on. But with filicide, we don't simply say there's something tragic going on. We say there's something really evil going on here, something even in cases where we would talk about it being more than just a deliberate act, even if it's involuntary, there's something so horrendous about that that we can't think otherwise about it. So there's filicide and suicide in comparison to murder more generically. Then where does abortion fit? Now, And I would love to say that it's a super easy category. You know, well, it goes on this side. It's a little worse or it's a little less worse. But it's not that. It's sort of two-sided. It's double-edged. And this is why we have such a complex conversation about it. But abortion is different. Even though it's taking the life of your own child, you'd like to say, well, this is just filicide. It's not because this is not every filicide. This is taking the life of a child while it's still in the womb. There's something different about that in two different directions. So let me go both directions. One way to see it is that it, that, that it is the same as filicide. That is, that the parental obligation is already in place. You know, th this is why, and, and, and even while the baby's in the womb, this is why we recognize, and pretty much everybody recognizes this, you've got a baby growing in the womb, you're going to have the baby, then you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't do drugs, you, you get proper nutrition, you take vitamins if you need to, you have prenatal visits. And if you don't, we say, oh, that's, you're, you can't do that. You can't, you know, you can't show up eight months pregnant and go into the bar and get drinks and expect everybody just to look the other way. It's not going to happen because we would say, no, you have a moral obligation as a parent to take care of that child, even though it's not born yet, right? So parental obligations do seem to extend into the womb, and so it becomes like filicide to us. And there's a, there, we did something with this in the past in responding to Judith Jarvis Tom. The, this article was written in the early 1970s about abortion before Roe v. Wade was even decided that actually, I think, you know, helped influence the culture in its way of thinking about abortion generally. And it's an article by Judith Jarvis Thompson on abortion. And, and the argument is really basic. It says, okay, well, let's just stop quibbling about whether it's a person or not. The fetus is a person or not. And let's just pretend it is a person. Now, I don't have to pretend that it's a human being, but Judith Jarvis Thompson was making the point because she doesn't, wouldn't have believed that it is. She said, well, let's just suppose it is a full-blown person, not just a human being, but a full-blown person, meaning with consciousness, awareness, and all that kind of stuff. Her statement was, even if that's the case, the mother still has no obligation to give her body to keep that person alive inside of her womb. And so she created a hypothetical comparison to it uh, about a, a violinist, an adult violinist. And I, there are moral conditions in all of this that are worth talking about in detail that we don't have time to do today. But her, but her example is important. Then it was, suppose this violinist needs someone to provide, you know, kidney function or something like that for them. And they're in the hospital, and, and lo and behold, you have the proper kidneys for it. And so you're kidnapped and put in the hospital, and you wake up, and you just find yourself strapped uh, to this hospital bed filtering blood for this violinist for nine months, and you didn't have any choice about it. Do you have the option to walk away from the violinist? You know, it's, a, it's an appeal to informed consent, the concept of informed consent, that you shouldn't have things done to your body you don't give approval to, and so you're supposed to be able to walk away from it. And, the, and that's her argument. She says any adult has the ability to say, no, uh, I'm not going to be in a hospital for nine months with this violinist, no matter how great they are as a violinist. I don't have an obligation to do that, and I'm very sorry for the violinist, right? 
And so she was saying, therefore, abortion should be okay, even if the baby is a human being with personality and so on. The response to that, which is super simple, the response to that was for us to say, but this isn't a stranger. This isn't some violinist that just happened to have a need to, for somebody to you know, provide kidney filters for it, for him. And so you just happen to find yourself awake taking care of the violinist. It's not that. This is her offspring. The, the sense of obligation to that offspring should be greater, not even just equal to what you would have for a stranger, but greater than you would have to a stranger. That argument which is one that I've made many times to people who are presenting Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument, that argument is based on the fact that parental obligations apply also in, in utero. They, they apply also to the prenatal child, right? Okay, so, I'm, so that's the one way to see it. And I'm, I like that way. I value that. I think there's importance to that. But there is another way to see it. And it's not, these are not mutually exclusive, as it turns out, oddly. The other way to see it is this, and this is just the reality of life. Some things are complex. The other way to see it is this, that parental obligation in place, and whether it was there or not, it wouldn't change this, but parental obligation or not, the mother is already making sacrifices that go far beyond normal parental obligations. That is, she's facing biological and bodily changes, including at least some pain and discomfort, She's facing behavioral changes, what she can eat or drink when she sleeps and what she's at, you know, and so on. And she's facing things that go way beyond what anyone else faces in, you know, ongoing parental obligations that come afterwards. And by the way, she's also facing some obligations. This is a a separate thing. It's a social thing that's not universal, but but it's largely present. She's also facing some uh, changes that may be imposed on her by others workplace restrictions or, you know, things like that, which uh, sometimes would be necessary, right? Hey, you're not going to work in the x-ray room anymore, so we're not going to give you any more hours in your part-time job as a radiologist. Well, you know, that affects everybody, right? So mothers face, when, they're, when they have a, a baby in utero, they face this, this reality that they're, they're actually meeting needs and making sacrifices, commitments. So from this perspective, the mother has already exceeded any other parental obligations. And, and, and as an example, I'm saying, the dad isn't facing the same biological and behavioral changes. I mean, even if he's having sympathetic abdomen growth, right? <laughs> I don't know, whatever. He's not facing the same thing the mother is facing. He's just not. It's, it's, a, it's a life-altering biological and psychological and sociological change, social change, in the woman. So however we're going to evaluate the rights of the mother relating to the rights of her prenatal infant, however we're going to think about that using the language of Judith Jarvis Thompson, we should be able to acknowledge that it's not the same relationship she has with a child that's already been born, and certainly not the same relationship that she has with a stranger. So so let me put it this way. She has obligations which go beyond herself to her offspring. I'm not, I'm not questioning that at all. In fact, I, w- I would ensconce that, you know. We need to know that. But we also have obligations to her because of what she's doing by default beyond anyone else for this child. She's giving things up for this child. No one else is giving up for this child, nor could they give it up for this child. And, and this is not a sterile lease arrangement she's made with some small biological being who's asked for nine months tenancy. You know, may I, may I I rent a space for nine months? I need to develop. It's not that there is a really bonding, deep personal. And I, I find beautiful. Obviously we, we would hope that it would lead to a health and well being sense in the mother and that, that that would lead to the same, the infant and so on. But I'm just saying there is there's something a mother is doing that goes beyond obligations. And this is why sometimes, you know, the term in Russia is mat geroin, a mother heroine, a hero mother. Uh, and it's about a certain group of mothers over there. It's a different thing historically. I'm just saying that the term is appropriate here. It's why we think of mothers as heroes sometimes. And, and, I, and I would mention again that, you know, historically the way motherhood happened was different than the way it is now. The risk level has gone down so much. And I'm not saying there's not, no risk, but I mean historically, the, 
the, the prospect of dying in childbirth was not a small prospect. And the, the reality of the picture that you were ushering your child to the gates of death so that they could come through that gate to enter into life was not a light metaphor. And the womb and tomb imagery is brought much closer together. We've talked about it before uh, on different episodes here. Womb and tomb imagery is brought a lot closer together when you realize how great a sacrifice was expected of mothers when they were bringing a child into the world. So, you know, another way to to say it uh, is this, uh, talking about abortion as a distinct, and again, I, I believe in the life of the child, so I do believe there is an unjust taking of a child's life when abortion happens. I, I don't have any any qualms about that whatsoever. We're talking about different categories of this wrongful taking of human life, and we went through suicide and filicide and getting to abortion. I would add this statement as well, that a different way to say it, in direct comparison with the broader category of murder. This is it. This is the only case that I know of or that I can think of where taking the victim's life requires a medical procedure on the actor, on the person who's doing it. That's different. Now, that doesn't make it okay. Now, I still don't think it's okay. I'm still pro-life. Don't, don't hear me wrong. We're not talking about whether abortion's okay or not. We're talking about what our response to abortion should be. And I'm saying our response to different kinds of even wrongful taking of human life is different. And we ought to consider whether this ought to be different as well. And uh, by the way, I would put the onus on people who keep saying, well, we need to throw these women in prison, you know, if they're going to have an abortion. I mean, I'm going to need evidence of why we would need to do that, taking into consideration the obvious distinctions that I'm mentioning today. So, for instance, if we take another step forward in the conversation, we go beyond just considering the acts themselves We should also consider the different kinds of responses we give to unjust acts. So among those responses, and this is not just about murder, not just about abortion, but just in general, there are all kinds of wrongful acts, clearly morally wrong, vicious acts that are are bad. No one should do them, and we should teach people not to do them. They require no response at all. Uh, In a sort of Humean sense, that's a reference to David Hume and his way of categorizing what's right and wrong into four different categories. And, you know, these would be the the places where insults or discourtesies go and things like that. It's not necessary to respond to everyone who treats you badly or who insults you or something like that. And and honestly, the more mature people get, uh, the less they feel like they do have to respond to things like that. And so a a lot of moral failures don't require a response, at least not from society as a whole or from every individual who is offended. And I'm not talking about children here. That's a different thing. You know, disciplining children and teaching children. Of course, you want to say to children, oh, well, you shouldn't have said that thing about our neighbor not being able to keep their house clean. Of course you should say that. But I'm saying if someone walks in and says, well, you don't keep your house very clean, do you? You don't necessarily have to have an argument with the person or become somehow embittered because they're discourteous. And so just, you know, we'll, if nothing else, maybe the response is just to be a better person, be more mature, right? So some moral failures don't really require much of a response at all or any response. Others re- require a minimal response, you know, telling personal lies. Well, that's not true, actually. I'm not saying about what I just said. I mean, if someone lies, you know, maybe it is necessary to correct them, and it probably is important to correct them. Well, that that's actually not correct, and, and I was there. You know, I saw what you said. I saw what you did, and uh, so, you know, we should tell the truth here, and, and not I'm not just talking about correcting your children. I mean, even in unpleasant situations, every once in a while, you have to interject and give at least a minimal response to something like that. And there are all kinds of examples we could give of that as well. And then there are things that are bad enough that we believe we need to hold people to account for them. Sometimes we hold people to account in a civil court, for instance. So we have civil proceedings and we expect reparations to be made of some kind. So this man broke down my fence and I'm suing him for the cost of my fence. And Judge Judy makes a ruling, right? Heaven forbid I should ever see an episode of that show. The commercials are bad enough. I'm sorry if you're a fan of Judge Judy. I'm sure it's a great show. And if you are Judge Judy, what are you doing listening to me? 
Anyway, the point is, civil reparations are one thing, and, I, and obviously I know there are courts that are actual civil courts where this takes place. I'm supposed to show up at one shortly for jury duty, uh, which I'll never qualify for because of some of my opinions about things like that. But anyway, here's the point to get back on topic. There are other things that we would put in a criminal court where we believe accountability or punishment is important enough that it rises to this level that we call criminality of some kind. So our question about this is, do we want to raise the category of a mother or a woman who's had an abortion to that level or to what level? Is it, you know, is it just saying, oh, well, here's a, here's a hand slap and a, and a correction. Is it just a moral teaching or is it something because you don't sit down with a person who's really dealing with suicide, for instance, and have a conversation about ethics Uh, that's probably not where the issue is. It's probably not a philosophical issue. Uh, I don't think, and in fact, I know people who've had conversations about Ernest Hemingway and other people, famous historical figures uh, who have had this happen in their lives. Nobody serious looks back on it and says, oh, well, it was his philosophy that led to this and that. Instead of looking back and saying, you know, what a tragedy mental health issues can be in a person's life, and why wouldn't we look at it that way? So there are other ways to respond to these things, and so we want to think about abortion as well. I'm not saying abortion is a mental health issue. I'm saying it could fit a different category than us simply saying, oh, well, this is something we need to treat as criminal conduct and therefore throw people into prison. So we also ought to think about, make some observations about criminalizing this particular issue, mothers, who have sought abortions. So there are a a lot of ways to talk about this. So first, I just want to, first, I just want to draw attention to something here. This is not specifically about um, throwing women in prison, but it's very closely related at this point in our history. There are some conflicts in our ways of thinking about criminality that are really starting to worry me. Uh, And I I do mean that. I mean, I look at our culture and society and I say, what are we thinking? What has gone wrong? For, For example, I remember sitting in fourth grade social studies. I think it was called social studies. I don't remember for sure. I didn't understand the class at all. And it's ironic that I ended up getting a PhD in humanities. But I just remember sitting in the class and thinking, what on earth are we doing in here? Why are we in here? Interdependency? What? Who cares? And, uh, you know, what, what, what difference does it make whether a society is this way or that way? Whatever. So it was weird. Fourth grade. But I remember reading about China. We were reading about the culture in China and Chinese communism. And again, fourth grade for me. What does that make me? Ten years old. So 1973. You know, I'm talking, you know, the height of the Cold War. And so, you know, for us, the Soviets were all fang-toothed criminals of some kind or another. We couldn't even comprehend how people could live in a society like that. And the Chinese were the same way. We just couldn't comprehend how people could live in such an oppressive regime. And one of the things I remember reading was, and of course, I I realize now that that's, you know, a caricature of those societies, which are much more complex than that. And I'm not justifying their communism or their government or any, and not saying there weren't abuses. There were. There were horrible things going on. But uh, it wasn't how it was caricatured. But one thing that was described that I don't think is much of a caricature, I think it's pretty accurate, that I remember reading and being horrified about was the idea that the Chinese government would teach children from their early childhood and families now, I have no idea if this is the case today. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not pronouncing a judgment on China. I'm telling you what happened when I was in fourth grade and I was reading about it, okay? That they would teach children from a young age and then they would grow up to do this for the rest of their lives to help the police enforce the things that they believed were important about their society to report their neighbors if they violated a law, right? I remember reading that and thinking, what a horrible place to live. Can you even imagine being told that you should keep an eye on your neighbor in case they violate the wish of the government to do this or that? Now, I get, well, they're making bombs over there, so, Mom, maybe we should call the police. Yeah, that that makes sense. I get that. But this was, and, and in particular, I remember being in social studies. Now, again, that was a long time ago. 
So, I, you know, this was 49 years ago or so. So I could be conflating some different things, but as I remember it, it was in the context of the, the one child policy that it was coming up because I remember, and I, we did talk about that policy as well in the social studies class. And again, I, I know it was urban and not everywhere and not, it, it wasn't enforced everywhere and all that kind of stuff, but, but it was this idea that a neighbor would keep an eye on their other neighbor to see if they were, you know, having more than one kid and then let the government know that they needed to do something about it, to intervene. Okay, well, that creeped me out. You know, as a fourth grader, just the thought that my neighbor would be a government spy on me to enforce what was going on, and then I'm listening to what we're doing now here, and I'm going, really? Do, do we think it's a good idea to turn neighbor against neighbor and say, hey, if you spot your neighbor trying to get out of the state so they can have an abortion, you know, you can take them to court and get money for it. I... I'm concerned that we think that's a good idea. Something's gone wrong with our thinking about how we relate to each other. You say, no, something's gone wrong if people are getting abortions. Agreed. Uh, agreed. I, I, don't, I don't have any, any qualms about agreeing on that. But this is not the solution. That we all become agents of government enforcement where the Constitution said that would be too much for the government to do? So we'll get the citizens to enforce it on each other instead? I, oof, something's up here. So I, I just want us to think more <laughs> about what we think is the best solution here. If we're going to say we have a free society, are we really going to be promoting a society in which we're all spying on each other and trying to figure out who can turn the other one into the government or can get some kind of uh, remuneration back because we found them doing something that, they shouldn't have been doing. I, I just, I'm not sure that's the response we want either. That said, I just, I just wanted to bring up, I, I think we've, we've gone a little overboard in some of the responses we're giving to this because it's not a matter of simply saying abortion is wrong. It's not even a matter of acknowledging that abortion is murder. It is. I don't have any problem with saying any of that. The issue is what should we do in response to it? How do we not only stop it, how do we keep it from happening? How do we prevent it? What do we do? So let me give another observation to this idea about criminalizing mothers who've sought abortions. And this is on the idea that a, a woman, so because there are some people who would say, well, we just prosecute them because they're committing murder. I mean, it's just that simple. Well, it's not that simple. And I'd love to have this conversation at length. We don't have time for it today. But it's not true that it's that simple. If it were that simple, then we'd be saying, oh, well, this, this woman had an abortion last year. And yeah, abortions were legal, but murder wasn't. And this is still murder. So now we're having her tried on murder charges. No, but, you know, we're not going to do that. And, and what's it going to do? It's just going to create another population that's going into prison and another reason for everything that we've been trying to do, which is develop a society that actually is pro-life, defensive of human life. It's just going to overturn that. We're just going to go back to what we were doing before, which is making somehow uh, abortion protected as a right in our society, which is the last thing in the world we should be willing to have. And so here I am saying to you, well, let's think about this differently then. So if you say, no, 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 we're talking about prosecuting mothers for abortion specifically, then I would say, look, let's start with a baseline of suicide because in Scripture there is a really strong comparison between the value of your own life and the value of your offspring. It is a different thing than the way we think of it in our societies. You know, we have a little child and then they just go off and they have their own life completely independently of us. Your family was your future in their world. So as we're reading scripture, there's a really strong comparison between the two. Does that mean we have to maintain it? I don't know, but we ought to talk about this at least. So as a baseline, let me just put down suicide for a minute and say a reasonable response to someone who has attempted suicide or who is contemplating suicide is, you know, obviously first get, get professional help immediately. And forget all the theory here. Seriously, get help for them. Don't just talk about it. Don't just bat it around. There's something seriously wrong, and you need to get help immediately. And if you yourself have ever contemplated this at all, you really need to back out of that position. Find someone to talk to 
that is not where you want to be, and you're not seeing the world clearly enough to make this decision. Allow us to help you find someone who you can talk to and allow them to help. Now, now let's go back to just a purely hypothetical conversation about it for a second. In the sense of John 10.10, this is not a complicated issue, theoretically, just outside of a personal conversation about a, a mental health issue that's going on. So again, just back to the concept of suicide. You know, it, this is easy. The thief comes to kill, to steal, to destroy. Jesus came so that they could have life and have it more abundantly. John 10, 10, easy verse. I always go to it when I'm talking to people who say, well, how do we know suicide's wrong? I just go to that verse and say, it's, it's simple. Because Jesus gives life. He promotes life. He encourages life. And more abundantly, it's the thief, the enemy, Satan, who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. So in a response to suicide, what we do is offer that. We offer hope. We offer a Christian alternative to the despair of life. And then we provide safety, even professionally, for the person who's so enmeshed in life's misery that they have failed to see the inherent priority of life over death. That's a Christian response to suicide. Hey, this is better. Life is better. Let us help. We will help that kind of approach. What we don't do is prosecute and imprison them. I found this person trying to commit suicide. Please arrest them and do that. No, it's still wrong. It still ought to be stopped. But prison isn't a reasonable response to it. And in Scripture, as I said a minute ago, life is in the heritage of the offspring. Now, it's obviously the case that filicide is wrong. And we talked about filicide earlier, you know, the killing, the wrongful killing of your offspring, which all, all of it's wrong. I'm not, I'm not categorizing it like that. But I'm saying there's something more wrong about filicide, something less comprehensible than about murder in general, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, motivated by theft or something like that. And so obviously, you know, a child that's living out here in the world is needing, you know, to be protected and, and so on. And so obviously there's imprisonment of some kind associated with that. That just follows from the conversation we had earlier about filicide. But then there's the case of abortion in which it, it obviously is wrong also to those of us who are pro-life and we, we get that this life in the womb ought to be regarded with the same respect that's given to life outside of the womb. I absolutely believe that. But there's also, obviously, to those of us who acknowledge this about that life, there's also something self-destructive about abortion itself. Now, again, if you've had an abortion, I'm not saying to you, your life is over, you can't be forgiven, your life can't be changed. I'm not saying any of that, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But I am saying to you, if, if, if all the things we've always said are the case, and, and I believe they are, that is, that women who have an abortion have gone through a tragic experience, and what they've lost is sad and devastating, and that they're going to need help and, and so on, That's, that should be our immediate response. Not just, oh, I found a person who did this thing, and now I'm going to throw them in prison. So, so let's make some observations about the imprisonment itself and see if we can get this in. So thinking of First of all, I don't know why we do this. We think of prisons this as this supreme act of criminal punishment. And thinking of it that way, putting person in prison, that's the supreme act of criminal punishment, has become, I, I agree with the assessment that a lot of people give to it. It's a, it's a serious problem in our country. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world. And since 1984, and there were lots of crimes committed before 1984. I was alive in the 60s and 70s. Since 1984, our prison population has grown five times over, 500% from around 300,000 people out of 150 million or so, maybe 200 million in 1984, to 1.5 million who are incarcerated this moment. So I, I'm raising this question here because even though there's, there's plenty of debate about, you know, that other people have about whether to incarcerate women who have an abortion, it's not a debate for me. I would not do that. There's not enough debate about the other question. The question we ought to be asking first, and if you're going to say we ought to imprison women who've uh, tried to get an abortion, then you need to ask this question too, which is whether we ought to imprison not just that, but 
why on earth we've come to view imprisonment as the sumum bonum of criminal justice, or why we've come to view criminal justice prosecution as the only acceptable expression in the evangelical world of talking about social justice. Why, why would prison be a solution to this issue? What would be the goal of imprisoning mothers? I mean, to what end? Uh, is it to protect society? From what? Uh, from another abortion? The, the, the society's not at risk of someone else being harmed by this mother. You say, well, well, there could be another abortion. There are no other ways to prevent another abortion than just to put a woman in prison? And is it, or if you say, no, no, it's not to protect the society. We got to punish this woman for what she did. Do you really want to punish someone who may have just gone through and likely did one of the most traumatic experiences of their life? Now we're going to punish them. The abortion itself is that. That's what pro-life workers have been telling us, and I believe them. I agree with this. For years about abortion, they've been saying it's one of the most traumatic experiences a person can go through. And now we're going to tack on to that. Oh, well, now we'd like to put you in prison for a while. Or the crisis which made them believe that abortion was their only option. And, and I'm saying this in cases where a person wouldn't have considered an abortion normally. There are plenty of other cases. I get it. But think, but think about this. You know, when we were talking about parental notification laws, for instance, People brought up on the other side, and sometimes they were ill-motivated. I'm not saying there's purity on either side of this discussion. But they brought up a legitimate observation that some of those parental notification laws did not take into account the fact that a child might be reporting the result of their own sexual abuse as a child in the home of their parent. And then they were required to inform their parent that they were considering getting an abortion. I'm not saying that other people shouldn't have been involved in the decision, that a juvenile should make a decision about an abortion. I'm not saying any of that. But I am saying we didn't take that into consideration. And are we going to continue down that road? Just saying, oh, well, no matter what has happened to you to bring you to this point. And if you don't think there are tragic circumstances that lead to pregnancies that lead people to conclude that they should have an abortion, you're just not being honest about people's needs and what actually happens in their lives, including with child abuse. And so, you know, the idea of throwing that person into prison, that, I, to, what, to what end? And, and the other tragic circumstance that goes with this that I'm talking about, you know, that says, you know, what are we trying to accomplish here? Even just straight up the loss of one of the greatest evidences of God's blessing in this life, they've given that up, they've lost that to begin with. And then we say, and now we're going to punish you by taking you and putting you into prison. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that as a benefit to the society or a need in punishing the woman. I, I, I'm just not making sense of it. And so maybe you can make sense of it, make that case. We'd be, and, and on top of that, to, you know, what we would be doing if we were imprisoning women, and I'm just talking about these general observations about imprisonment in general right now we would be adding another population to the already too long list of people, 1.5 million right now, who are imprisoned to no benefit for society or themselves. Drug addicts, for instance. Well, you know, we've learned over time that there, there's, no, there's no benefit in punishing drug addicts by putting them in prison. And so we've learned, oh, well, punish the, fine, punish the dealers, punish those who are bringing the drugs into the, into the country, but not the addicts. Addicts need rehab, you see? I'm not saying being addicted to drugs is not morally, uh, it, it, that the person who's addicted is not morally responsible or not morally culpable. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying it's not wrong. I, I believe both of those things. And yet I think what they need is rehab, not imprisonment. Or juveniles. We, we don't, you know, put, putting a juvenile into the prison system is just training them for a life outside of the norms of society. And we've learned that. We've learned that, and many, many, many people are giving themselves to trying to remedy that problem. Juveniles need homes. We know that. I'm not saying every juvenile, delinquent or otherwise, can be re rehabilitated. I'm not saying that every person's going to come out not to be a criminal. But I'm saying certainly we've learned by now 
that you don't just put a child into prison and punish them. And then they, so we know that juveniles need something different from that. A lot of people, not all, but a lot of people who are getting abortions are juveniles. And I'm not just talking, you know, 17 year olds. Sometimes they're much younger than that, but I am talking about 17 and 18 year olds as well. Or immigrants talking about prison populations, immigrant laborers. Why, you know, why are we throwing people behind bars? And I know, I, I know sometimes we do this, sometimes we don't. It depends on who's the administration at the moment. To imprison someone for risking everything, for instance, and this is a noble side of it. I know there are less noble sides to this as well. In order to send money home to their family. Oh, we're putting you in prison. Instead of, you know, so, and, and you could even say it on the employer side. Uh, but I do think there are abuses that take place on the employer side, and it makes sense to fine or imprison some of the employers who are hiring illegal immigrants because of the abuses that they're bringing to pass. But it doesn't make sense to fill our prisons with, with issues like this or with people like this. So in reality, what I would want to do is have a conversation, a serious talk, about women and those who have sought abortions or had abortions and whether it really makes sense to put them in prison. So in, in order to have that conversation, and this would, this would take just a few more minutes, so I know I'm realizing I'm, I'm running out of time in this episode, but, but it would be to take this step forward. And so I'll say, I'll say this briefly, and then I'll add a lot more detail to the criminal justice side of the conversation in another episode, okay? But, but briefly put this, first, of course we should prevent abortions. So we should take it off the table as the third option. So I'm glad we overturned Roe v. Wade, and I hope we make it so that uh, raising a child and, or making an adoption plan are the two options that people have in mind. I hope we stop clinics and physicians from providing elective abortions. I hope we do that. I think we should provide education and resources to revive the awareness that pregnancies don't have to be unwanted, but we should also support education and resources for, for preventing unwanted pregnancies, right? So do what we can to help in both of those directions. But then second, we should be more intentional about how we respond to women who have sought or had an abortion. And I do think there is a comparison we should be making with suicide. And, and listen, I, I, I will go on about this in the next episode, but while there is suicide present in the Bible, there is no response to suicide present in the Bible. None. There's nothing that says what to do if somebody's contemplating or considering it. it. It doesn't exist. It's not present. And the same is true about abortion. There is, but, but the thing about abortion is it's not discussed in the Bible at all. There are miscarriages talked about. There are other things that happen that are similar to it that are talked about, but it's not talked about at all as abortion. I, again, that doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean it doesn't say anything about the value of the child in the womb. It does. We'll talk about that in the next episode where we bring this up. But we ought to be willing to consider the comparison with suicide before we start drawing conclusions about what we're going to do with women who have contemplated or sought an abortion. And I know I'm not giving all the answers here, so let me just give a conclusion this way. Just taking into consideration the nature of imprisonment in our society and what we have and haven't even thought about it regarding criminal justice in general, Taking into consideration the difference between a mother with a child inside of her body and anyone else in the world. And taking into consideration the questionable value of imprisonment as a response to a lot of even grave injustices. Then I think we have reason to pause making the assertion that we drag mothers off to prison. I encourage us instead to serve mothers many of whom have done nothing more than internalize, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying there's not personal culpability here, but they have simply internalized the values our culture has been teaching for 50 years. I think we ought to serve those mothers so we can find a better way forward than incarcerating another part of our population. This is, you know, the responses would be, look, just think about, think about it this way. Think about it from our perspective. They want to throw us, and I mean conservatives or evangelicals or whatever you want to call us, in prison when we preach about sins they don't want to hear about, right? So that, that, this is how we, we characterize it often. Now what? We want to throw them in prison when they don't agree with our definition about the boundaries of life? I think we can do better than joining in that fray. So let's sit and kneel 
with the ones around whom everyone else is gathered, ready to throw the first stone. Let's be the ones who serve those who are surrounded by judges, the way Christ served the woman who was brought to him, so that they and we can go and sin no Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.